Hello and welcome to Video Games as Literature, English 481 and 581, a six-week summer course offered at St. Cloud State University. I'm the professor of the course, Dr. Matt Barton, and uh, in these introductory uh, comments, I want to tell you about my plans for the course, the syllabus, and uh, get into the list of games we'll be playing and tell you a little bit about the type of literary theory we'll be using uh, in this course. Uh, but first, though, I want to address what I imagine is the elephant in the room, uh, namely, can video games be literature? What does that even mean? Can we really take video games as seriously uh, academically as we do uh, Shakespeare's plays, let's say, or Byron's poems? Uh, so first I want to ask you uh, to define what the word literature means to you. So don't look it up in a dictionary. Uh, just think about the word literature and how you would use it and how you define it. Now that we've had a chance to uh, think about literature, I want to think about get you to think about the video game uh, as a work of literature. And I thought a, a simple way to start this discussion would be just to ask you about how many hours per week do you play video games? Now I'll just say at the outset here, uh, you won't be graded in this course based on how well you play video games. It's not a, a skill-based course in that way. Uh, but I do want you to be thinking about video games, and maybe you've played the games we'll be playing in this course before, or maybe you haven't, but in any case, I want you to keep an open mind and uh, be mindful as we play these games. Uh, so according to Jane McGonigal, uh, we spend, on average, or I guess uh, the world spends, 3 billion hours per week playing video games. I mean, that is truly amazing, and that should really be an eye-opener uh, that it's it's hard to exaggerate the uh, cultural impact uh, that video games have had. Now, a lot of people like to focus just on the negatives, uh, the violent video games and <laughs> video game addiction and so on. Uh, but the reason I like Jane McGonigal, and I'm quoting her here, is that she takes a different view, uh, namely that video games can enhance productivity and enhance learning. They can be great learning devices uh, if we just think about them in an intelligent fashion and not just have that knee-jerk reaction to them. Uh, a couple other myths that we should dispel. Uh, one is that only boys play video games or the games are really meant for boys. Uh, this is a very unfortunate uh, myth that seems to hang it seems to have hung around a lot longer than I thought it would. Uh, but the reality is, and again uh, according to McGonagall, that 94% uh, of teenage girls play video games. So it's definitely not a guy thing. And I imagine that these, as these girls get older, uh, the demographics will shift. Which brings me to the third uh, stat I want to bring up, uh, that, or the idea that video games are just for kids and small children. Now, actually, quite a, quite a few adults play, as you can see here, over 50% of uh, people that are between 30 and 49 uh, play video games. Now, uh, they might not have an Xbox they're playing these games on, right? It could be a game on their mobile phone, or it could be a game on their computer. Uh, or even a Facebook game or, some, or Solitaire. Uh, so there's all kinds of different video games. So we're not just going to be focusing on those big sort of Halo, Call of Duty type games in this course. Uh, now, I thought as a way to get into the topic of the course, which is video games as literature, I wanted to think about, I wanted to uh, talk about something that's not actually a video game, uh, but I think is quite relevant and a nice uh, way to uh, segue into this discussion. Namely, this book here. This is The Abominable Snowman by R.A. Montgomery. And if you haven't seen a book like this before, I think you'll be pretty interested in how this is laid out. So it's called a Choose Your Own Adventure Book. Now, I know some of you probably have read these before, uh, but the idea is, instead of just reading this, starting, uh, you know, turning each page and going through it in a linear fashion, uh, you read a little scenario, and then at the bottom of the page, there will be instructions and a couple of choices. Uh, you know, if you want to do this, turn to page four. If you want to do something else, turn to page nine. And basically, it's an interactive narrative. It's what I would call an interactive narrative because you get to make choices as a reader as to you know, how you want to proceed. It's not just the author making all the decisions for you. Uh, now, one point to keep in mind with a book like this, obviously, it's a small book, and there's not just an infinite number of possibilities, right? This branching or forked narrative is... Uh, for practical considerations, limited, so that a lot of these choices would just be, you're dead, <laughs> the end. 
so they're not usually what you want to do is have a bookmark so you can go back to the page just in case you <laughs> die kind of a way to save your game I guess uh, but anyway I think these are interesting books and uh, you can see already how even in a printed format we're sort of getting into it what's what I would call sort of a game narrative right now, Sid Meier is one of the most celebrated video game designers of all time. He did the Civilization series. It's probably his most famous game. Uh, but he defines video games as a, quote, series of interesting decisions. Uh, so again, I, I think about this book and how, really, this book could be described as a series of interesting decisions, right? Uh, but for Sid uh, Meier, video games are all about making these kinds of decisions and uh, we get to see the consequences played out right before our, our eyes, which I think is exciting. So uh, what I want to do is build on Sid's definition of video games a bit here, and I'll be, uh, we'll get into this when we start to read the Thobbit, or Tobit book. But if we think critically about those decisions that we make, so yes, they're interesting decisions, but let's think about why they're interesting, right? And as we're playing these games, we can ask ourselves why we're making those decisions and later, uh, think about them, reflect on them, and the goal there would be to learn more about ourselves, right? our critical thinking processes, our sense of ethics, and uh, maybe even a glimpse into our subconscious mind. I think he'll uh, really enjoy it. It's almost a therapeutic exercise, I think. And uh, so Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, so I want to think about this course as uh, examining games, and the unexamined game is not worth playing. Now there's lots of different ways that stories have been used in video games over the uh, decades. If you go back far enough, uh, the technology was so primitive, or so crude, I mean it was very advanced for the time of course, but you know, in, <laughs> compared to the stuff we have now it seems really primitive. Uh, but they didn't have enough memory to put the text, the narration, much less a cutscene into a, a video game. So what, uh, what you would have instead would be a manual or if it's an arcade machine, maybe a story printed on the cabinet somewhere. Uh, but this is an example of this. This is from a game called Adventure uh, by Warren Robinette. And as you can see here, there's a story that Warren uh, created that describes what, what's taking place on the screen. Now, if you didn't have this manual, uh, you might not even know this red thing here is a dragon. A lot of people that played the game thought, joked maybe, or maybe they actually thought this, that these were killer ducks <laughs> They were out to get the yellow square. So you might ask, why do we need this story? Uh, well, it's there to make the game more interesting. It wouldn't be very interesting if you had a game that was just about a block moving around a screen and touching other blocks and avoiding other blocks and little squares and things. Uh, that's a little too abstract uh, to be much fun. So uh, even from the earliest games, uh, designers have tried to find ways to make the action and decisions that you're making more interesting by adding a story. And I wanted to talk about this particular game here too because uh, it's called Adventure and I think that he got the title for that or he was thinking about a game called Adventure, another game called Adventure or Colossal Cave Adventure uh, which is another of these early, early computer games and this one is interesting because it's entirely text. So as you can see there, you type in commands and the parser interprets those commands and, and you can uh, explore and solve puzzles and do all sorts of fun things. And by the way, these uh, text adventures, as they're called, or interactive fiction, are still around. And there's a few contests you can enter every, there's the uh, a big one every year where people decide who wrote the best uh, interactive fiction. And I was tempted to put one of these games on the syllabus, but Again, we only got six weeks, so I will put some links to them if you would like to explore those text adventure games. I think they're uh, really cool. I want to talk to you a little bit about how designers uh, think about game narrative. Uh, so these are the people that actually make the games. Uh, we've got Shigeru Miyamoto there, who's uh, the creator of Mario and Zelda and Donkey Kong. And uh, he did, he's done lots of really innovative things with stories and games. I mean, think Donkey Kong was a revolutionary game because it had this sort of movie-like story that went with it. I mean, that was uh, basically unprecedented at the time. Uh, but uh, Miyamoto says that many of the people involved in the industry are trying to make their games more like movies. They are longing to make movies rather than making video games. Uh, so thinking about Donkey Kong, I wonder if uh, Miyamoto might be thinking about himself here too. Uh, but 
I wanted to bring up this quotation because you can see there how there seems to be a tension uh, between movies and the types of stories that get told in movies and what people think a game ought to be. You know, you shouldn't just be watching the game, you should be playing the game, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that idea later. Uh, here's another take, and this one is from John Carmack, who created Wolfenstein 3D and Doom, or co-created it, I guess I should say. And he's uh, got an infamous quotation about this topic. He says, a story in a game is like a story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not that important. So I apologize for the inappropriateness of this comment, uh, but I think, again, it really shows how, the, how some game developers have uh, some kind of, a, I guess you would say, a contempt uh, for stories and games and writers. Uh, they see the stories as just getting in the way of what is important in a game. In a game like Doom, you know, you're there to shoot the, uh, the demons, right? Not uh, sit there and read all kinds of books and watch all sorts of cutscenes and movies and things. And then uh, finally, uh, Will Wright here, who created The Sims and uh, Sim City, uh, he says the games are not the right medium to tell stories. Video games are more about story possibilities. Uh, so Will Wright, he's always talking about this possibility space uh, of games. So basically the game is, I kind of think about it as a, sort of a stage with props and actors up, up there sort of improvising as they go along. And the game sort of enables them to create whatever story they, they like, uh, rather than just have a story told to them in a, in a linear fashion. And so that's the designers. I don't have quotes uh, from the scholars, but suffice it to say, and I'll go into, I'll probably go into this uh, throughout the semester, and the author talks about it as well, but in uh, scholarship, game studies uh, scholarship, there tends to be a split between the uh, ludologists and the narratologists, which basically amounts to uh, the ludologist thinks that story and characters and all and writing and all the stuff like that uh, are the least interesting and the least significant thing about games. We really shouldn't focus on that when we talk about when we do game studies. Uh, it's the game elements, the rules of the game, the way the game is played and so on, uh, input uh, controls, all that sort of thing. It's a lot more important than the story, which is kind of incidental. And of course, uh, as you can imagine, the narratologists take the opposite view, or at least uh, have, uh, think that the uh, story is a lot more important than those the ludologist would seem to think. Uh, anyway, I don't really, I think they're both kind of, I don't like the, any kind of extreme uh, views like this. I think they're, uh, I think stories and games uh, can work pretty well together. Sometimes it can be done poorly, uh, but when it's done really well, I think you have a, it can have an impact on you that really can't be matched by a story told in another medium. All right, so that's a little bit of uh, background here. I want to go uh, now into the types of assignments we'll be doing in the course. Uh, what we're watching now, what you're watching now is a, an Edpuzzle lecture. Uh, so these are, is a YouTube video that's been embedded in this Edpuzzle tool so that periodically I could put questions in for you to answer. And those uh, don't, you don't need to write really long, lengthy responses to these questions, by the way. It's just a way to uh, get some feedback and help you to pay attention. Uh, so that'll be part of the assignments. Uh, but the bigger part, though, is the player response essays. And to help you build these essays, uh, I have what's called a nugget assignment that comes before them. So basically, this, this is how it's going to work, or this is my plan anyway. We'll play a game uh, for a couple of days, and I want you to try to get in maybe 8 to 10 hours of gameplay in. More would be nice, but you know, do what you can. And as you're playing, you need to be, again, being uh, mindful as a player and thinking about decisions that you make as you play that game and moments in the game that really sort of stand out to you, right? They have an impact, emotional impact. It could be maybe it really makes you angry, or maybe you feel really sad about something that happens, or uh, really happy. It, you know, just uh, it doesn't really matter. What matters is it has some kind of impact on you, right? Uh, maybe it's curiosity. So I want you to think about that moment and then describe it in the form of uh, just a couple of sentences, two or three sentences, and we'll post those to the site for the course. And then uh, later you'll come back and uh, read other people's nuggets and respond to those nuggets. Just maybe you didn't have that same reaction or maybe you want to share your uh, thoughts on that moment or uh, whatever you like. But that's to kind of simulate 
the, my goal with that is to kind of simulate the sort of back and forth discussion you have in a class, face to face class. And so again, don't need to write essays here, I'm talking about two or three sentences, and then maybe a response could be a sentence or two, and uh, that's fine for those. But the reason I have that is to give you some ideas uh, flowing, get some ideas flowing for the response essays. So I'll go in a lot more in, into detail about what these are in the uh, probably in the next lecture or two, but uh, for now, what you need to know is you want to just write it and, and be done with it. Uh, there's a rough draft that you uh, produce, and then uh, you'll go in and get peer reviews done. You'll do peer reviews. Of course, people will review uh, your work, and then you'll submit the final draft. So uh, I find this process works pretty well. It'll all be done online, uh, although you can, of course, go to the right place. And then finally, a little final exam, uh, which shouldn't be a problem for anyone. Okay, so I want to wrap this up by talking briefly about the game selection and uh, why I chose these particular games. Uh, first up, we'll have Ken Levine's Bioshock. Now, this is a classic game. It's widely considered one of the best games of all time. Uh, it's described as a shooter unlike any you've, any you've ever played. And I don't, I wasn't, my original idea wasn't to have a, a lot of first-person shooter sort of action titles on the, on the syllabus, but uh, this is the one of the games that our author, textbook author, plays and talks a lot about. So I thought it would behoove us to play it, uh, but we won't be doing a response essay to that one. Instead, I want you to read uh, the textbook author's response and think about that as you as kind of a model or a guide. So when you do yours, you'll have a good example to follow. Uh, the next game would be Ragnar Tornquist: The Longest Journey. Uh, this is one of my favorite games. Came out back in 2000. It's called a graphical adventure game or a point-and-click uh, adventure, as they're sometimes called. And this is about a, a young woman named April Ryan and her journey between parallel universes. And uh, it's just, I don't want to spoil the game too, uh, by telling you too much about it now, uh, but suffice it to say, it's a very deep and rewarding narrative, and you know everybody that plays it seems to really love it, and I think you will too. Uh, then we'll have a game called uh, Papers, Please by Lucas Pope. This came out in 2013. This is described as a dystopian document thriller. And I think it's a really great example of how a video game can inspire uh, or foster good critical thinking skills. You know, I think you'll, when you play that game, uh, I think you'll be impressed. And then we have uh, Barbe and Coke's Life is Strange. Now this is a, a five-part episodic game. Uh, that sets out to revolutionize story-based choice and consequence games. So I thought, uh, first let me say a little bit about that episodic thing. So uh, what you'll see nowadays in the adventure game world anyway, they, they tend to come out in episodes like the Walking Dead games and, and the Life is Strange and the, well, there's one about, a, was it the wolf? <laughs> I forget the name of it. Uh, anyway, there's a wolf game like this. Uh, so they, they kind of break them up into episodes or chapters and if you want to have the whole experience, you need to get all of them. But for our purposes, I think the first episode will be enough. Uh, that should give you a pretty good idea. And of course, you're free <laughs> uh, to play the other ones uh, whenever you like. Uh, but anyway, it's, it seems like a pretty obvious choice to me since they're specifically focused on uh, the consequences of decisions and interesting decisions. And I, uh, again, very popular, very well-loved game. Uh, then we'll play the Stanley Parable by Reedon and Pugh or Pug, I'm guessing it's probably Pew. Uh, this is a, quote, first-person exploration game. You will play as Stanley, and you will not play as Stanley. You will follow a story, you will not follow a story. You will have a choice, you will have no choice. The game will end, the game will never end. Uh, so I think that's, that's a wonderful description there. And again, one of these games that I think does some really interesting things with narratives and interac interaction. And I think you'll enjoy this, and I think it... You know, as you'll see, once we get a little deeper into the player response, I mean, it just seems ideal for a course like this one. And then uh, finally, we'll uh, play the uh, we'll play uh, Toby Fox's Undertale. This is a 2015 game uh, that's really, really uh, getting all kinds of critical acclaim. It's described as the RPG game where you don't have to destroy anyone. And I think it again really uh, brings to the fore the possibilities of games as storytelling devices, but beyond that, games as transformative experiences. Uh, games is kind of emancipating your critical thinking skills, right? Your, your intellect. Uh, so I think you'll enjoy all of these games, but uh, more importantly, will gain 
<laughs> uh, by playing them and thinking and writing about them. All right, so I think I've covered pretty much everything I need to in this introduction, but if you do have questions, please post them uh, now. So thank you for that, and I will be seeing you again very soon.